וזה יתחיל לעשות הקלטה. אוקיי, אוקיי, גרייט, תודה. אוקיי, עכשיו זה בסדר. Thank you, Nathan. Toda. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So, uh, what we will do today? Everyone can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, how is everyone doing? Okay. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Yeah. In the you're fine. Baruch Hashem. So, what I would like us to do is that, uh, like every every time that we teach, so obviously I would like to make it interactive, but sometimes there are some background noises and sounds. So, everyone can please mute your own microphones, and if you have something to add, to comment, or to ask, so please unmute and ask the question, and we can have some kind of an interactive discussion as well. Okay? Okay. So what we will do today is we will try to understand um, some of the reasons that led for uh, Hashem to choose Moshe Rabbeinu as a leader. And basically it will really will try to uh, address the question, one of the most famous questions, especially in leadership, is leadership is something that someone is born with. And if you are not born with the leadership qualities, you just can't make it. Or it's, uh, it's really something that you can uh, acquire and you can possess in terms of uh, leadership uh, qualities. So what we will try to do is to try to see through the Midrashim, especially Shmot Rabbah, to try to see what was the Midrash perspective. And then to obviously to go from there to the way that Hashem revealed himself to Moshe and to try to understand what are the messages. So the first source, That, uh, that we can see is Umoshe Aya Ro'e, that's the Midrash in Shemot Rabba, Umoshe Aya Ro'e. So the Pasuk that the Midrash is trying to understand is Umoshe Aya Ro'e. And the word that it seems to be superfluous is the word Aya. Because it could say Umoshe Ro'e et Zonitro. Moshe is the shepherd for Itro. But what does it mean Aya? כל מי שכתוב בו היה, מתוקן לכך, says the Midrash, which means everyone who has the word in the Pasuk היה, he's already being designated for it. He's someone who was destined to be a roe, to be a shepherd. And the Midrash tried to obviously to substantiate it with a hochacha, with a proof. And it says, אין אהדם היה. which means that was after the what? After the chet, after the sin of Adam and Chava. And Hashem and the angels basically said, en Adam haya, metukan lekach haya. What does it mean, metukan lekach haya? He was already destined to what? Metukan haya mavet lavo laolam. Shenemar vechoshech al pnei teom, zu mita shemachshich pnei habriot. Which means when it says about the nachash, Sorry, about Adam and Chava. And Adam Aya ke achad mimenu, that he became like one of us, so to speak. So the Midrash says, Adam Arishon was destined to bring death to the world. So the word Haya means not only that he was, it's not only just a descriptive word to try to, to describe to us the profession or other things, but rather it's more of a destiny. And then, the Anachash Aya Arum, which means what? And the serpent was uh, deceiving or cunning. It's also metukan lepur anutaya. He was destined to be the evil person, the evil figure in the Tanakh, and therefore he, later on he will be punished. Benoach k'tivo haya. Metukan haya l'geula. Also with Noach, ish tzadik haya. It's not only that he was, but he was destined to be a person that will bring redemption. Yosef k'tivo haya. And also Yosef has the word haya, Yosef haya yefe toar ve mare, and then also he was metukan le parnasa, he was destined for what? For sustenance. Umurdechai le hatsala, and where it says, we just read it, umurdechai, ish yudi haya beshushan ushmo murdechai, also he was destined for salvation le hatsala, ve moshe le geula. And moshe haya roe, so moshe it means what? He was destined to be a shepherd, and he was destined to be what? To be the redeemer. So he was destined, what, from his birth to be the leader and to be the shepherd. So if we stop here for just a second, obviously we see something very interesting. 
we see that the first Midrash talks about what? Talks about the idea of being a leader from the get-go, from birth, basically. Moshe was destined to be a shepherd. Then he was obviously destined to be the shepherd for the Jewish people. Now, if we stop here, and then, now you can unmute for a few minutes, and we can have a little bit of a discussion. What do you think this Midrash talks about in terms of Moshe's election, uh, to be elected as the leader? Is that nature or nurture? Nature. Please introduce yourself so we can see each other. Phil, this is nature. It's nature. It's, it's preordained. Okay, Phil says nature. Why? Because he was, he was it, Hashem set it up so that he uh, first was a ro'eh, and uh, then ultimately he was a ro'eh for B'nai Israel. Or okay. Very good. So Moshe basically was born as a leader, and then probably he just had to develop his qualities. But not more than that, but he had to become a leader in order to what? In order to continue to lead the Jewish people. So this Midrash, by the way, does not talk only about Moshe. He also talks about other leaders like Moshe, like Yosef, like Mordechai, and even leaders for not necessarily <laughs> positive things like the Nachash or even Adam Arishon, that some people are in a way destined to something and then they continue to lead their lives in the way they were destined to. So that was the first Midrash. I'm going to again share the screen and we're going to see the second Midrash. So the second Midrash says, Af Moshe, Loba, second source. You can, do you see my, uh, do you see the, um, the sign here, Af Moshe? Yeah. yeah. Af Moshe, lo bachano ela batson. Also Moshe was tested uh, with the flock. Amru Rabotein. And this is one of the most famous Midrashim. Kishaya Moshe roe tson shel itro ba midbar, when Moshe was shepherding, it was a flock to the desert, Barach mimeno gdi echad. One little uh, lamb ran away from him. Ad shegi alachsot. Kevan shegi alachsot nizdamna lo brecha shel maim veamad agdi lishtot. So this little lamb ran away from Moshe Rabbeinu and he went to the little well and started drinking. Kevan shegi a Moshe etzlo. So when Moshe, Moshe was chasing him and then when he realized that he was thirsty, amalo, which is obviously a very interesting midrash. You know, obviously Moshe didn't talk to the lamb. I didn't know that you ran away because you were tired, or I would even add, and thirsty. So what did he do? So Moshe put this little lamb on his shoulders, and he went back to the flock. You have mercy and compassion to lead the flock of Yitro. Chayecha atatir etzoni. You're going to want to be the shepherd of my flock. Oi, u Moshe ayaroe. So, first and foremost, this midrash um, does not talk only about being a leader from birth. However, it talks about a test that Moshe had to pass in order to what to be the leader. And the test was what? The test Rahab. was rachamim, compassion. It's very interesting. It's not about qualities such as charisma, intellect, um, I don't know, uh, financial abilities. It talks about what? It talks about rachamim. It talks about compassion. The first thing that the leader has to have is compassion. You know, one of the very famous uh, quotes from Reb Chaim Ibrisk, who was definitely a scholar and was the one to develop the new idea of how to learn Gemara. He says that one of the most important thing for rabbis, if not the most important thing for a rabbi, is to have rachamim, is to have chesed and rachamim. So we see in this midrash, we see an unbelievable thing. The most important thing for leadership is yesh lecha rachamim, you have compassion. So that's the first thing. The second thing in terms of the focus that we need to have on the Midrash is that this Midrash focus on another word in the Pasuk. The first Midrash talks about Haya, the word Haya. And the Midrash understood that Haya means what? Destined to be something. This Midrash 
talks more about what? About the word ro'e. Very good, thank you, Rabiona. Ro'e, which means why do we need to know that he was a shepherd? How does that help me to know anything about Moshe's leadership? And therefore, this Midrash says that the ro'e, the profession that Moshe had at that time, gave him, in a way, the opportunity to prove himself as a good leader. Moshe did not know he's going to be the leader of a nation. He just wanted to be the best shepherd he can be for the flock. And the, way, the best way to be the best leader for the flock was to have rachamim, to have compassion. And Hashem basically took it and did copy-paste. And he says, Ata tiretsoni, you're going to what? To lead, to lead my flock. So now I will ask you, what do you think? Is this Midrash talks about nature or nurture or both? Hi, it's Mayor and Jeff. Hey, how are you? Thank God we're here. Yeah. Please um, wave. Uh, <laughs> we're what? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, this is the future, I guess. Anyway, so uh, to me, I still think he has this innateness in him that was he was born with. But uh, a lot of the tests, I think, that all our avot had were to, it wasn't so much God was testing them to see what they would do, it was to show them that what they were capable of doing. So that's, that's how I view that. So I think it's still more na nature, but you need, to, you need to be able to see somehow in yourself what you're capable of. And mo that's what Hashem was telling them. Since you showed this Rachamim, which I, he was born with innately, there's more you can do. Okay, so in a way what Jeff is suggesting that this Midrash talks really about some kind of an integration um, of both nature and nurture, meaning people are born with some great qualities, but they need to be tested in A, to prove to themselves that they can take their potential out, and B, sometimes they need to be tested for the supreme leader, really from Hashem himself, to prove, quote unquote, to him and to others that they are capable. So this Midrash, even though it's the same Midrash in terms of Shmot Rabbah, it talks about a different perspective in Moshe's leadership. If the first one talks about only may you add Lekach was destined for it, meaning all nature, this Midrash talks about some kind of an integration of both nature, but you need to be tested in order to really bring out your potential to me, koach lapoal, as we say in Hebrew, from the potential to what? To, to the reality. Don't you think there's also a requirement that there has to be something in the environment that encourages the, the manifestation of that compassion? Um, just one second. Okay, yes, I think so. I think in a way, maybe we can even make it a, an internal integration. We can say because Moshe was a shepherd and because he had something from nature, he was destined to be the leader. He was put in a position and an environment that he can be tested and prove himself, which can be that in a way, if Hashem gave you the qualities, he will put you, I mean, we can talk obviously about Chirach of Shit, which obviously it's a theological discussion, it's not for this year, but it definitely can bring up the, the idea that if someone was born with some uh, specific qualities, in a way he will find himself or herself in a situation where he or she will need to bring this potential out and to try to what to prove themselves to be to really to be worthy of what they were destined before. Okay. Couldn't you also say that the, the it's not so much the test as a this is Phil speaking. Hey, hey Phil. Couldn't you say that it's not so much a test as it is Hashem giving him the opportunity to further develop the quality of Rachami. In other words, like like Jeff said, he has it innate but he has to develop it by finding the sheep and working with the sheep and experiencing that, he further develops the quality that Hashem gave him. Sure. I think Rabbi Akiva was the best example. Who is talking now? Elat. Elat, hi. How was your best example? Oh, she muted. One second. Rav Shai? Yes. Johnny Krug and Phyllis Krug. Hey. Um, 
from the first time we're introduced to Moshe, where it says, There is a dualistic descriptor of Moshe that, yes, the infant, but the cry that emanated was not the cry of an infant, but was the cry, the non-narcissistic cry of somebody who was always who was already older, who felt the pain of his people. The very first time we're introduced to Moshe, we're already given this dualistic descriptor of him. Oh, very nice. Also, but I thought you're going to uh, quote the second word after that, Vatachmol alav, and she had compassion on him and she saved him, which Moshe probably took for his life and took this chemla, this compassion, Mm -hmm. and implemented it in his own life, which can also be an interesting thing that, you know, where did he learn Chemla from? He, he might even learn it from, from his adoptive mother, from Bat Paro, which can be interesting. So now let's go back to the source sheet. I will try to explain. And, um, and let's see Midrash Lishi. Shmot Rabbi, Rabbi. just one, one comment. That's, that's what I had in mind a few minutes ago when I asked you about the environment in which he was raised. That there was an implication that people surrounding him we're also encouraged the development of that compassion and empathy for other people. Oh, okay. So, okay, very good. I will just add one more thing to what you are saying is that it's interesting. The only one who had chemla at his environment was Bat Paro. He was surrounded until the age of 16 with cruel people. And, you know, and when we went out from the palace, the first thing he saw was this, what's going on with his brothers. And he just couldn't, he just couldn't, tolerate such a such a behavior and he had to stop it so that he killed the egyptian and then he tried to stop between the two jewish men and then between the shepherds and not it all meaning this this sense of chemla he definitely got from home and when i'm saying home it's more but paro not paro not paro himself definitely and to some extent not even his parents because he was not with them uh, can I, it's, hi good morning it's liora hey liora I- Hey, Bokertov. Bokertov. That just, as we're, just as we're saying this, it makes me think about the fact that Miriam was a, um, a personality who was a take action and a consideration of the, the, the whole kahal. So that maybe also provides us with an element of support to the nature, uh, that there's something genetic, maybe. Ah, interesting. So you are saying that when, um, okay, interesting. So Moshe, in a way, was born... Oh, okay, so you're going back to the nature, that Moshe had it in his nature, and then it was developed. He perhaps even knew about the fact that uh, Paro's daughter saved him and had tremendous compassion on him, and he himself developed it even more um, until he was tested with a, sh- with a flock, and then he was elected as the leader. Can yeah, you that, hear me? that the family, the family mm-hmm. prototypes right. present us with the thing to suggest that there's nature maybe they're also okay by yeah, the way just his to, mother to, his to mother was his ner- his his mother was his nursemaid right miriam went and got his mother yocheved and so yocheved was nursing him so she was in his life for some period right but probably only until the age of two uh and that's, that's, that's was, foundational that's pretty that's foundational. foundational okay and who was speaking i couldn't hear oh that was barbara kessel hi ah, hey 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 Okay, everyone can hear me, by the way? Yes. Okay. Everyone just, wait I, I for, just, one, yeah. for one second? Yes. Okay. Okay. I, I, it's Paul here. I, I, I was thinking maybe also that it is, it is a, from nature, and then we're learning about the characteristics that he had. Later on, we find out that he's unloved. We find that he's caring as Racham Is this also the same thing? He has a speech impediment which doesn't affect his ability to lead. And also the the things that other people were saying. I don't think it's developing very common. I think it's the Torah is telling us what the characteristics of leadership are. Uh So you would like to say that everything was quote unquote in him, and then the Midrash, and and based on what the Torah says, try to explore one attribute after another. Right, exactly. That's also a possibility, but let's go now back to the Midrash. And uh, let's see Midrash, the third Midrash. So the Midrash says, Shmot Rabba, Davar Acher, Hu Moshe Aya Ro'e, Hadaru Dichtiv, that's what it says, Kol Imrat Eloka Tzrufa, 
מגן הוא לכל החוסים בו. זה פסוק פה משלי, פסוק פה פרוורבס, that it says that the entirety of God's words is צרוף, which means it's purified and it's clear, and השם is a shield for everyone who trust in him. So then the Midrash says, אין הקדוש ברוך הוא נותן גדולה לאדם עד שבדקו בדבר קטן, ואחר כך מעלהו לגדולה. השם will never give greatness and a great position to a person until he is being tested, even in a small thing, and only after that God elevates him for greatness. והרי לך שני גדולי הדור, and here you can find two great leaders, שבדקן, that השם tested them, ונמצאו נאמנים ויביאן לגדולה. And השם tested them, and they were found to be trustworthy, and השם brought them to greatness. בדק לדוד בצאן, he tested דוד with a flak, ולא נהגם אלא במדבר, כדי להרחיקן מן הגזל. דוד took the flak to where? To the desert, in order to distance them from the gazel. שכן אליאב אומר, אליאב was דוד's brother, ועל מי נטשת מעט הצאן ההנה במדבר? Who did you leave uh, responsible for the flak that you brought to the desert? מלמד. שהיה דוד מקיים דבר המשנה, it teaches us that David was fulfilling what the Mishnah says, obviously the Mishnah was not around in the time of David, but just the idea, אין מגדלים בהמה דרך ישראל, אמר להקדוש ברוך הוא, נמצאת הנאמן בצום, בוא וראה צוני. So Hashem said to David, you were found to be trustworthy leading the flock, come and, and, uh, and be the shepherd for my flock, meaning for my nation, שנאמר, מאחר עלות אביאו לראות ביעקב עמו, that Hashem brought David from shepherding his flock to be the shepherd of the Jewish people. וכן במשה הוא אומר, וינהג את הצאן אחר המדבר, להוציאו מן הגזל. To what? To bring him to the desert in order to distance himself from the gazel from stealing. ולקחו הקדוש ברוך הוא לראות את ישראל, Hashem took him to be the shepherd of the Jewish nation, שנאמר, נחית כצאן עמך ביד משה ואהרון. אוקיי, so this midrash, first and foremost, I would like to ask you, this midrash, what was the word in the pasuk that the midrash was focusing on? נו, אחר המדבר בו, משה. אחר המדבר, very good, יונה, thank you. אחר המדבר, this is totally superfluous, why do I care where משה took the flock? if he took them to the city, or maybe he was in quarantine, right? Who cares that he took him to the desert? So the focus of this Midrash is unlike what we said before, that the focus was on Haya or on Ro'e. This Midrash talks about Achar HaMidbar. Why do I need to know that? So, why do I need to know that? So the Midrash talks about what? The idea of distancing yourself, not social distancing, but... Distancing yourself from what? From Gezel. That's why David and Moshe, and who else in Tanakh, according to the Midrash, distanced himself from the Gezel? Abraham. Abraham. Very good. Ro'ei Abraham. Abraham. Exactly. He took them to the desert in order not to, um, not to be trapped with someone else's property. So therefore, according to this Midrash, Why was Moshe chosen to be the leader of the Jewish people? Because of his personal choice, you know, his, his behavior that he developed, not because he was born with it, but because the way he behaved. Very good. That's exactly what this Midrash says. This Midrash, number three, also contradicts number one. When you look at that from the Pshat, The pshat is that the number, number, the first Midrash talked about Moshe was destined to be the leader. Number three said Moshe was a shepherd like everyone else, but he did something that no one else did, which was every other shepherd took the flock to the most convenient place and they didn't care even if they will have a little bit of gzela. Moshe Rabbeinu did not want it. He was a yeresh he was naki chapayim, he was not corrupt, And obviously he took the flock to a place that was very challenging because to find in the desert a place where the, where the flock can find enough food is challenging. It's much easier to go to the city and to find some kind of grass or whatever the flock will eat. But Moshe chose the difficult way 
in order to distance himself from, from Gezer. By the way, give me another proof, give me another hochacha, that uh, Moshe really distanced himself, really give me two, that Moshe really distanced himself from any, even um, from any suspicious of taking public money uh, without permission. When he the the, gave the uh, talk at the end of his life about lo chamar echad lakachti lo nasati dechad mehem all that. Very good, Mark. Thank you. So one in Parashat Korach, where he says to Korach, "Go ahead. You, I didn't take even one donkey when I came from Mitzrayim. When I came from Amidian to Mitzrayim, to save you. Very good. That's the first one. Where is the second one? Gives an accounting. I think this is the first one. When he gives an accounting of the Mishkan, of the money collected for the Mishkan, of the things that are collected for the Mishkan. Okay, so <laughs> and he knows that the end of Parshat Kude, Moshe gives an account, an accounting for everything he took, and even the Midrash talks about the idea that he didn't know what happened with uh, a small amount of money, and then he remembered that was Vavim La Amudim, which means Moshe was so careful. To be so clean and to be so clear and to be so pure in terms of public funds, so he basically distanced himself from everything that really started from being a shepherd to his flock. So we see that the third midrash talks about nurture. It's something that Moshe developed. He might have it <coughs> with someone who didn't want to be involved too much with public funds, but. He, the fact that he was willing to take this extra mile, this extra step, and to distance himself from Gezen and to do something that is more difficult was obviously something that proved that he was supposed to be. <laughs> By the way, just as a side note, just as a side note, just as a side note, if someone can please someone can can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Somebody has to mute. Somebody has to mute. Rabbi, I believe... Rabbi, I think you can mute everybody. And then right. if somebody else can unmute. I can mute everybody? Yes, correct. Um, that would be a great thing to do. Yeah. Maybe I should take it to Shul. Yeah. When we open up. Can you imagine that I can unmute everyone in Tfila? Wow. <laughs> would, would you like it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we will go back to the source sheet to number four. Okay, Vain Haget at Son Ahara Midbar. Lama Haya Rodef La Midbar. Why did Moshe go to the Midbar? What was there that he found there so attractive to go to the Midbar? So the Midrash says, he saw, he had some kind of a, a vision or a prophetic vision that Am Israel is going to be elevated from the Midbar, from the desert. The man, the mana, and the slav, the well, the mishkan, and the tabernacle, the ashkina, the keuna, the malchut, the ananei akavod. So, this midrash, first, talks about the, in the beginning of the Midrash, also Achar HaMidbar. Achar means not only after, but Achar HaMidbar meaning like chasing the Midbar, like Achar HaDvarim Ha'ele, something that he saw that will come after the Midbar. Achar not to the desert, but rather after the desert. That's how the Midrash plays with the word, Achar HaMidbar, which means Moshe, it's not necessarily that he really went to the Midbar itself, but rather he was what? He was going to the place that he saw in his prophetic vision that the Jewish people will, be, will emerge or will be elevated from the Midbar. So now this is something very interesting. This Midrash now talks about something that really happened in the future. Moshe Moshe, quote unquote, will be the leader that will take the Jewish people into the desert. And a desert, by definition, is a place of desolation. It's a place where it's really empty. There is nothing that can grow there. But Moshe saw the potential where 
not so much in him, we saw the potential in the people. So now we are talking about a leader that has one of the most important things that we need for a leader. This Midrash does not talk about compassion. This Midrash does not talk about This Midrash talks about what? A leader must see a vision. If a leader has a vision, he can see the raw potential in the people and he can elevate them. He can see a dark place and bring light. The most important thing according to this Midrash is that Moshe took the Mitzon Achar HaMidbar, he understood. The Jewish people now are not exactly the best people. They have slave mentality, they are not ready, they need to go through a lot of afflictions, they need to go through a lot of tribulations in order to prove themselves. But he saw the desert is, might be even the best place for them to grow and to bring the most precious gifts to the Jewish people. The Shechina, the Mishkan, the man, the Slav, all those miracles, day-to-day -day miracles, and also future, um, future things to, uh, for our Kedusha, he saw that in the people. I see that there are three uh, participants who raised their hand. So please unmute, and if you have a question, please ask. Isn't that the Chacham rather than the Navi? Because Ezehu Chacham Harue et Anolad. Um, yes, yeah, so in Moshe, you really have both. Moshe was obviously a Chacham, <laughs> but at the same time, Moshe was also the ultimate Navi. So he saw both. He saw something with a prophetic vision, but prophetic vision is wonderful, but if you don't know how to quote unquote walk the crowd and how to identify qualities and good attributes in people and to develop it in within them you can have a prophetic vision but you will not know how to do it yes rabbi if if he had this prophetic vision uh, my name is jack why was he so reluctant and hesitant when hashem first spoke to him very good question. I just want to say that the Midrash does not walk according to chronological order. He takes the Achara Midbar as almost like um, a future pasuk, even though chronologically it's from the beginning. Meaning everything that the Midrash uh, refers to happened much later in the time of the desert. If you talk about the building of the tabernacle, it was obviously a year after the Jewish people went out from its time and all sorts of things. So the Midrash takes the, the liberty in terms of interpretation and takes things that happen in the future and bring them to something that didn't really even happen yet. So that's why. Uh, Someone Rav else raise his hand? Yes, Rav, Rav Shai, Paul. Hey, been, how are you? I'm fine. It still doesn't conclusively prove that it wasn't from birth. Again, we, 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 we're seeing characteristics during his lifetime and you're trying to say that this was self-taught after he, after, he, after he became a leader and, and, uh, and learning it from the Midrash. But I'm not sure that's conclusive from the Midrash. We're seeing okay. events in his life. Can you repeat your question? I couldn't hear it. Your original question was whether it was a leadership from birth, a nature or nurture. That was your question. And I'm not sure we're getting conclusive evidence from the Midrash team. Because we're seeing events that have occurred in his lifetime, and we and again we're showing his characteristics. Ah, okay. So you are um, basically causing me to jump a little bit to my co the conclusion of the shiur. Um, mm. So maybe I will just say it now, just in a in a in a really short way, and then we will develop it a little bit later. I think that the question of nature or nurture that is still being discussed in the 21st century, will continue to be discussed until the day of Mashiach. I think the answer is somewhere in between. Um, I do believe that people can possess and acquire and develop leadership qualities, but sometimes if you have it, you have it, and if you don't, maybe you, not everyone should be a leader. Many people are good followers, many people can do many different things, but not necessarily to be a leader. You know, sometimes I see Rav Yona on my left side, but you know, there are some wonderful, wonderful teachers and the school doesn't know what to do with them. 
they raise their salary and they give them all sorts of names. But the teachers, in order to build up their uh, resume, they want to be administrators. But not every great teacher can be a great administrator and vice versa. <laughs> when you take a great teacher and you make him administrator, you are ruining him. So someone can be very good in one thing, but does not mean he can be wonderful in a different thing. Raviona can be both, but the idea is, is that what we have is that some, everyone wants, sometimes everyone wants to be a leader, but with leadership comes responsibility and tremendous responsibility. Responsibility to lead, to responsibility to the people that you are leading and responsibility to really to have some kind of a prophetic vision of where you lead the people to. So leadership is something that I think you need to have a little bit from birth, but if you don't develop it and you rely only on what you have from birth, you're not going to be a good leader. So it seems to be that there needs to be some kind of an integration. So now let's go back. I think, I think there's a problem here. The word nurture is being used in two different ways. One is, it's Chuck Friedman. Hey. Um, usually the word nurture is used, because it means the environment around you, your parents, your friends, and so on, are helping you develop and indeed instilling in you certain kinds of qualities. But I think there's also, what you're talking about here is not just nurture from outside, it's that you have potential, but you have to develop the potential. In the case of Moshe, it may have partly have come from outside, but it was partly from internal. So you have the, na the starting point, do you have the nature? Do you have outsiders helping you nurture, like your parents? And also, do you develop yourself in some ways, which may or may not have anything to do with the environment around you? So, if I will ask you to um, point out all the components that you think that need the, that the leader needs, what would you say? Oh, that's that's a very difficult question. But I, in this case, I think what we're looking at, though, in terms of how Moshe developed, that. We're attributing some of it to Bat Paro, perhaps some of it to Miriam, but we're also saying he himself, without having outside influences, had certain things which developed that nature that he had within him in Rachamim. For example, um, picking up the sheep. Now, that's not something he learned from nurture, from watching other people. It's something he developed. So he took what was implicit in him, was an innate in him initially, and developed it over time so as to develop the, the characteristics of a leader. Uh -huh. Okay, interesting. Very good. I think, by the way, also, um, there is, you know what, I'll ask you a question. What is one of the most obvious attributes or traits that Moshe had, and the Torah mentioned it three times, and the Midrash totally, is totally oblivious to it? Yeah. And and it just it. The what? He can't tolerate injustice. Very good. In the Torah, also modest, obvious, modesty, three times, humility. humility. For something that you <clears throat> not tolerate, and the Midrashim totally oblivious to it. They talk about compassion, they talk about they talk about prophetic vision or just a vision and developing potential, but they don't talk about justice, which we will maybe go back to it. So now let's go back to the Midrash and then we'll continue on the discussion. Um, oh, so we, I don't know what I did. One second. Okay, one second. Oh, here we go. Okay, so then it says, Davar Acher, meaning another interpretation, Vainhag et atzon achar amidbar. Amar Abi Yoshua, Amar le HaKadosh Baruch Hu le Moshe, Ata atid le'alot Yisrael. You are going to want to be the one to la'alot, to basically take Israel out from Mitzrayim. בזכות מי, in whose merit, בזכות אברהם שדיבר עמו בין הבתרים. Because of Avram that Hashem spoke to him in the covenant between the parts, ואין מדבר אלא דיבור שנאמר ומדברך נאווה. What is מדברך? מדברך. The Midrash takes again the liberty of interpretation and it says מדברך, it's not that your desert is nice, but your words are nice. Now, by the way, you see, Rabbi Yoshua was a Tana. Reshlakish was an Amora. So you see that the Midrash in Shmot Rabbah, who probably was composed, at least the first part of Shmot Rabbah was composed somewhere in the 5th 
or sixth century, he brings Resh Lakish as well, which is obviously, he never saw Rabbi Yoshua. But Resh Lakish Amar, Amar no HaKadosh Baruch Hu LeMoshe, Siman Zelecha, this is a sign for you. Bamidbar Ata Manichan, Umin Amidbar Ata Atid Lachziran Leatid Lavo. Shenemar, Lachen Anochim Mepatiya Valachtiya Bamidbar. So now this Midrash, this uh, 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 part of the Midrash, brings a tremendous amount of insight to, to Moshe's leadership and to Moshe's relationship with Hashem. Um, let's stop sharing here. Okay. The first idea of Rabbi Yoshua is that Achar Hamidbar is really, how should you read it? Look at the, at the manipulation of the Pasuk. Achar Hadibur, not after the desert or to the desert, like what we saw at the beginning, but Achar Hamidbar, meaning after the one that Hashem spoke with him, which means Avraham Avinu, because the first time that um, the enslavement, the Shi'abud Mitzrayim was mentioned was in the time of Avraham Bebrit Bein Abetarim, which means what? Which means an interesting thing. Why was Moshe chosen according to this Midrash? We don't know. He was chosen. Probably Hashem saw something in him that maybe Moshe developed much later on. But, or maybe because Moshe was maybe one of the only Jews who was not enslaved. Because most Jews, or all Jews, were enslaved. Leave alone the Midrashim that talks about Shevet Levi. But let's talk about a Jew who was not under the, the thumb of Paro. It was probably not even a Jew, a Hebrew. It was only Moshe. All the other Jews were somehow enslaved under Paro. So perhaps that was the reason why Moshe was chosen, because he was just the only one who was available. Everyone was basically enslaved. And the reason for him to be the leader was Achar HaMidbar. Moshe was taking the son Achar HaMidbar. He was following this uh, prophetic uh, covenant, not prophetic covenant, real covenant that Hashem had with Avraham Avinu in Brit Ben Abetarim. So in a way, Moshe was chosen because it was time. It was time to fulfill the covenant. It is a fascinating thing because there is really a dispute among them, the Farshim. We are not sure exactly. If, according to the Torah, it seems to be that Moshe was shepherding the flock. Hashem revealed himself to him. And then Moshe went immediately to Mitzrayim. Some of Farshim says that no, Moshe had this interaction with God when he was much younger. He went to Mitzrayim, he failed, he went back to Midian, and then he came back to Mitzrayim. So we are not exactly sure about the order. But we definitely understand that Moshe here is being chosen not because he was destined to be a leader, just because Hashem saw something in him, or maybe Hashem just saw him available and picked on him and told him, hey, you go ahead and be my agent to fulfill the covenant between the parts. That's what Rabbi Yoshua said, which was definitely not nature. It's not even, I'm not sure if it's even nurture. It's something that Hashem picked on Moshe and told him, you're going to be my shaliach. You're going to be my agent. Now, Rish Lakish said something totally different. Rish Lakish, if you, if you go back to what Rish Lakish says, Rish Lakish says that why did he go to the desert? Because the desert was the place that Hashem knew that he is going to basically place the Jewish people, which, by the way, it's it's not such a positive uh, description. What does it mean? What do you think it means? Bamidbar atamanichan. What does that mean? That's where you're going to leave them. Yes, which means what? When die, die. Very good. And what's the pasuk? Bamidbar yamutu v'sham itamu. That's immediately after Chetam Meraglim. The desert, the Mila Midbar, is being mentioned, and, it, and there is some kind of an emphasis on the word Bamidbar. So you, Moshe, in a way, you're going to fail them. In a way, you're going to bury them in the Midbar. This is based on other Midrashim, that the Midrashim says that Moshe will, one of them proves that there is Tchiyat Amitim, is that Moshe will bring the Jewish people from the Midbar to Eretz Israel. So what does that mean? It means midbar, he will bring them, I would say the Midrash in a way, Reshlakish reads it not 
that he led them, but Vayenaheg, meaning he led them, or he, I don't know even how you will say that, uh, what would be the poem in English? Vayenaheg, um, meaning oh, he, will, he will lead the Tzon after he will leave them in the Midbar, he will bring them later on to the Promised Land. So that's Rosh Lakish. And then he says, Davar Acher, Lama Haya Rodef Lamidbar, why would he go to the desert? Shetzapa Sheatid Lachrid Kirchei Umot Aulam, Kmodeat Amar Ine Acharid Goim Midbar Tsiya Vearava. So this rush now takes really, um, um, I would say, a, a, a prophecy that why Achar Amidbar, Shetzapa Sheatid Lachrid Kirchei Umot Aulam. He saw that the Jewish people will be able to destroy huge cities <coughs> that, um, that belong to the other nations. So why to go to the desert according to this Midrash? What's the idea of this Davar Achel? The enemies will be destroyed and their towns, their lives will be like Midbar at the end. So Vayin Haget Atzon, pause. Ashmosh is going to lead the Atzon in a way that he will destroy the other nations. And Achar, after that, the others will be like a Midbar, will be like a Shmama, they will be a total desolation. You see how the Midrash is so creative that sometimes it really to totally ignore the Pshat of the Pasuk and basically try to what? Try to send a message. Because also, don't forget, Shmot Rabbah, fifth century in Eretz Israel, is not a good time. Sixth, fifth, fifth, sixth century in Eretz Israel is not a great time for Jews. Jews are not independent, and, um, and there is a xerot, there are some decrees, um, very unpleasant decrees from the other nations. So there is always this idea, this dream, that we will become independent again. So the Midrash is saying, look, now it's the time of desert for us, but there is going to be a time that we will be okay, we will flourish, and the others will be in a, in a, in a situation of a desert. And then the Midrash says, Davar Acher, Vainhag et Atzon Achar Amidbar. Bisro, Hashem told him, She Israel, a Kruya Atzon, that the Jewish people that are also named or are being mechune, being named Tzon, Yamutu Bamidbar, they will die in the desert. Vechen Beshaar Shitava Moshe Tzorchem Shel Israel. And also when Moshe demanded that Hashem will address uh, the Jewish people's needs, please tell me, my beloved one, how would you lead them? The word roe, how would you Meaning, when Moshe was accepting upon himself to be the Shaliach, to save the Jewish people, he says to, to Hashem, don't appoint me first to be a shepherd. You are the ultimate shepherd. Did you? Uh, made, made all the, did you make all the preparations to lead the Jewish people? Did you have, do you have enough food? Do you have enough medical um, equipment for them? Heshivo HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Im lo tedi lach hayafa banashim, Im lo yadat sofcha, Tzi lach beikvei atzon, Veagdaim ata roe, Klomar ahavot itamu bamidbar, Veabanim nichnasim, Veein ata roe abanim, Ela an mishkenot aroim, we see um, this is very sad midrash in a way. Achara midbar is already some kind of a, of a statement to Moshe Rabbeinu. Achara midbar, Moshe naaget atzon, achara midbar until the desert. But that's it. No more. Hashem says in a way to Moshe, you're going to lead the people? but you're not going to lead them to the promised land, already from the beginning. Now, why is that? I think we talked about it once in our shiurim, but uh, one of the flaws or the deficiencies that uh, Moshe really showed at the beginning is lack of uh, savlanut, lack of, uh, of patient, patience. Um, in terms of um, when Hashem sent him to his first mission and he failed, he immediately came to Hashem and says, Lama reot alama ze lama ze shalachtani. And Hashem says to him at the end of Parashat Shmot, Atatire, now you will see what I'm about to do to Paro. But the Midrash says, now you will see, but no, but not later. Which, which means you will stop in the desert. So now, let's stop here for just a second. And I will ask you 
a simple question. You see a flaw in this midrash, in this specific source. The flaw is that this midrash, especially the three other davar acher, takes the pasuk <coughs> totally deviate from the question of what? Nature or nurture. Everyone is with me? Yep. Again, let's do some uh, exercise. Everyone, raise your hands, please. <laughs> okay, so I need to see that everyone is alive. Very good. So now, the question that I asked, the initial question was nature versus nurture. And we saw that the Midrashim, especially the first, second, and third, and the beginning of the fourth source really addressed that question, fully addressed that question, brought different opinions, we could read it in a different perspective, that's all okay, but it addresses this question. What do you think happened in the last source, especially with the last three davar acher, that totally deviated from that question? Is my question clear? Can you, can you hear me? Yes, Phil, hello. You see, hi. It seems to me, depending when it was written, whether it's prospective for the future or a summary of the past, the the sad one that you Moshe will not make it is, is written by somebody who knew that he did not make it. It's not a prophecy; it's a lament in a sense. And on that basis, we're talking about Moshe's life. He did what he had to do based on how he was raised. And afterwards, you have to be a chacham and say, "Hashem told you in the desert that you're going to only make it to the desert; you're not going to enter." That was not a prophecy. That was a report. Nebuch, many years later. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So you are basically, this is like a, a, a paraphrase historic, as we say in Hebrew. Meaning you, you know something that happened, and then you have some kind of lamentation on what happened to him. Yeah. Okay. And, and, very, and very sad and very honest, because Moshe never fulfilled his personal desire to make it into Eretz Israel. He did not lead the Jews into Eretz Israel. He okay. had a very hard life in many respects. Right. Okay, so I think you are right. I will add one more thing. And that's how I would like to conclude really this. Uh, I hope it was very interactive show uh, with, uh, what is that? 91 participants, I think. Okay, so I would like to, uh, to suggest to you that the last three parts of the fourth Midrash did not deviate, but rather gave us the true meaning of leadership. I would like to say that the last three parts that talked about the fact that Moshe couldn't bring the Jewish people into the land of Israel, and basically they died in the desert. And you can look at that as Moshe failed in his leadership. Moshe failed in his mission. I would like to suggest that leadership is not necessarily being tested by the end goal, which means was the mission fully, uh, was, was fully accomplished. There is also a ta'alich, there is also a process. I think that shows the greatness that Moshe had, which means if I am right in my uh, theory that Moshe in a way already perhaps even knew he is not going to bring the Jewish people to Eretz Israel, he should do one of two things. He should quit. If I don't get it, I should quit. Or alternatively, not be a great leader, not to pray for the Jewish people after Cheta Egel and after Cheta Meraglin, and not to do everything he did to the extent of Im Ein Mecheni Nami Sifrecha Asher Katafka. He was willing to die for the Jewish people. There was definitely, even later on in Bamidbar, when Hashem told Moshe, that he will die, that he will not go, in Sefer Dvarim, sorry, that he will not go into the land of Israel. And really, when he will die, the Jewish people will enter the land of Israel. Moshe is trying to finish up everything quickly, and he does not try to make any delays in order to delay the entry to the land of Israel. A true leader does not do it for himself. He's doing that for the people. A true leader loves his people. He will continue to lead the Jewish people. Even though he knows he himself will not get the trophy. He himself 
will not win the prize. Because for a true leader, he is Shalia for Hashem. And if Hashem needs me to bring the people to here, and then there's going to be someone else who is going to lead them to another place, that's okay with me. I think, by the way, if someone can, okay. If I think, by the way, there is another another leader. Yeah, it's on, it's, it's on me now. Similar. Okay. Very similar. So basically, what happens is if you are Goldwag, put yourself on mute. Goldwag, put yourself on mute. Everybody. I, I know what that was. Please mute everybody. Oh, I think I knew how to mute. Okay. So there is another leader who is very similar to that, which is Yosef and Rachel. I really would like to suggest. Basically, was should be the leader of the Jewish people of the family. But when she realized oh, so that her sister is going to be, is going to be, um, is going to be embarrassed, she gave away her privilege to be the mother of all Israel. Yosef did the same thing. Yosef could slap the idea of not telling everyone that he is Yosef and to bring his father and his father will bow down to him and to fulfill his dreams. But he knew that's enough. The people are to the family is together, the family is reunited. And it's time to really and it's time to let go. Joseph also that understand that if he needs to let go, he will. And Moshe did the same thing. Moshe led the people with tremendous courage and and really had to work very hard to bring those people from its time to the desert and to get them ready. But when he realized that the storm is gone, the storm is better, then, then he, he was done and he was all good with it. He understood that that's what is needed, that's what is being required, and he, he was a truly... But you know what? It doesn't matter. So Melissa, listen, it keeps unmuting over and over again. I'm very embarrassed. It keeps by itself. It's going to. Okay, is is that now? Can everyone hear me? Just raise your hand. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. So, in conclusion, I don't think that the last part of the last midrash is basically deviating. I think it gives the purpose of leadership. There is always going to be the question of nurture versus nurture, and I think that the answer is somewhere in between. You need to have something from, the, from birth, but you need to develop it. You need to take it, you need to take it from the koach to the poal. You need to uh, use the environment, the atmosphere, your upbringing, in order to be a better leader. But this is a question that we really cannot fully decide. But one thing we can decide, a true leader is someone who takes care of his flock. That's on, not himself. He is someone who is willing to lead, even if it's only to the midbar even if he does not get the trophy, even though he does not really accomplish his true mission, he is going to do everything in his power to bring the people to a better place, and he does. And because of that, Moshe is always going to be remembered. It's Moshe Rabbeinu. He's our teacher. He's teaching us, what does it mean to be a true leader? What does it mean to be someone who takes care of the people like real flock? with chemla, with compassion, distance himself from things that he should not be too close to, with justice, with the desire for justice, and with true meaning of humility. So I would like to wish you all, everyone, have a wonderful and a healthy day. And I know it's a little hard, it's challenging times for all of us, but we should, Bezrat Hashem, all know and hope for better days. They are going to be here. Bezrat Hashem, avarnu et paro, na'avor gam et zeh bezrat Hashem. Please listen to the instructions of the Ministry of Health. Uh, it's not the time to be tzaddik, it's time to be chacham. It, 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 those are really times that we need to follow the instructions and to keep ourselves healthy and to continue to learn Torah, to daven, to say tehillim, to help each other, to reach out to each other, to spread kindness and light. And bezrat Hashem, Soon, I don't know when, but soon, we will be able to regather in the Beit Midrash and to learn the emet 
פנים אל פנים. להתראות אוהב. תודה רבה. תודה רבה.